Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. Today I'm going to be talking about the 10 do's and don'ts of creativity. Uh, 10 different guiding principles that can be applied to almost any creative endeavor. Now uh, I'm going to be getting work done as I uh, do this video, inking this illustration. It is very vertically oriented, so a little hard to fit into the frame. I thought I would show you at least once here at the beginning what the complete image looks like, because indeed I will be uh, zoomed in as I proceed to go through these different points. Uh, that way you'll be able to see in greater detail uh, the individual strokes of the pen as I uh, get the inking done. So let's go ahead and get started with my first guiding principle. All right, just quickly before I get started, I wanted to point out that I've decided not to tape this down. You're going to see me spinning it around. Sorry if it's sort of disorienting, but this will show you the genuine inking process. People are going to ask, what's the pen? What pen are you using? It is the Pigma Micron 08. Uh, but I always like to say, no need to get the exact pen that I use, by all means experiment and find the pens uh, that suit you the best. Let's go ahead and get started then with the first of these so-called do's and don'ts of creativity. Number one, create the kind of thing that you yourself would enjoy. Now that may seem uh, kind of obvious. What, I'm going to create a story that I don't enjoy? Uh, no, but I think sometimes you're thinking about the marketplace and uh, you're like, well, I gotta, you know, this is what's trendy right now, so I better write this story that will, um, that uh, editors will be willing to look at and uh, you kind of uh, somewhere along the way may forget to <laughs> make it something that you yourself would like to read. Those are the ones that succeed uh, the best. And I hear people, whether it's writing, music, whatever, I hear again and again creative people uh, saying this, you know, uh, I, I wanted to create the kind of thing that I uh, would enjoy. And I think that comes through in the final work, you know, to make it maybe more specific, uh, to my uh, work, when I created Mickey Falls or Brody's Ghost, um, you know, I was indeed creating the kind of story that, that I liked. And uh, let's say with Brody's Ghost, I had uh, thought, well, boy, a lot of people like gory violence and blood and guts. I better try to work this into the story so as to reach that audience. Well, I wouldn't have been true to myself. I would have been kind of debasing myself a little. And, and the truth is I probably would not have succeeded in reaching those people either because they would sort of see through it. They would be like, yeah, Mark, your heart doesn't seem to be in this. Uh, you seem like a guy who's imitating people who <laughs> uh, are into violence. You yourself clearly are not uh, in terms of your storytelling. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's just basically always best to trust your own instincts, create the kind of thing that you yourself uh, would like to experience, whether it's a story, uh, music, or whatever. Let's move on to number two. Uh, everything should be a choice, not something done automatically out of habit. Uh, indeed, this is something people have heard me say before. It's one of the very few kind of rules of creativity that I would stand behind um, all the time, basically. I feel that uh, there is a danger in doing something automatically. You lose your humanity in a way. You just uh, you sit down like, I always do it this way because I always do it this way. No, I think uh, things should be a, uh, a creative decision. You've, you've thought about different ways of doing it. You've you maybe even tried out different ways, and you select the one that works best. Um, and uh, basically, I think that can be applied to almost uh, anything, this idea of uh, choices, you know? I remember hearing Brad Bird talk about, uh, I think it was The Incredibles, uh, that uh, he felt like the whole thing was just decisions, uh, choices, and you're throwing all these decisions down into a giant hole, <laughs> was the way he described it. Because of animation, you know, you don't, you don't see the immediate results. Uh, and uh, he thought, you, you know, there's this sort of delay between making the decisions and actually seeing the results of it. But uh, clearly he made very much the right choices uh, in The Incredibles, in, in my opinion, one of the best movies of all time. Let's move on now to number three. Specifics are more interesting than generalities. This one uh, actually I think can be best uh, explained by way of um, uh, public speaking, actually. Um, imagine you are sitting in an auditorium and uh, the person is up there at the podium and they begin their speech by saying, you know, today mankind stands at a crossroads. <laughs> There is enormous potential for progress. 
And yet, and, and it's gonna be like 10 more minutes like that and everyone in the audience is just gonna be, dude, wake me up when you're done. Why? You're just talking about generalities. There's nothing to pull you in. Now, if that same person gets up there and says, you know, this morning when I was standing in Starbucks, there was this guy behind me and he, all right, already we're like a little more interested. Oh, oh yeah, what are you, what about that guy in Starbucks? Tell me about the guy. <laughs> you know, I think we are hardwired for storytelling, for specifics, for details. And uh, uh, of course, I mean, I've given the example of uh, public speaking, but I think this can be applied to all kinds of things. Um, if you ever find yourself in a moment of um, some character delivering some big monologue and all it is is platitudes and generalities and uh, stuff like that, uh, maybe you better step back and, and come up with some details that will liven things up, make things more interesting uh, for the reader. Let's move on now to number four. Be aware of how accessible your work is. Now this one, I have to admit, I sort of revised. I was gonna say, make sure that your work is at least a little bit accessible. <laughs> That's my instinct as a creative person. I sometimes feel locked out of the work by people who are, you know, so zeroed in on what they're, on the story that they're trying to tell that they have failed to make it comprehensible even on the most fundamental level uh, for someone like me who's reading the story and, and I'm just like, I don't even know what's going on here uh, because they have uh, just written it in such a way that they understand what's going on but uh, we the readers feel a little lost because they've made it kind of inaccessible. Uh, but I did decide to sort of revise that to uh, be aware of how accessible your work is. Sometimes you may deliberately make something that's not accessible. I think of um, you know, like uh, John Lennon's song in the Beatles, uh, A Day in the Life. Uh, some of those lyrics, not super comprehensible, it's sort of poetic, it's uh, stuff that uh, maybe is not 100% accessible, but that was a deliberate choice on his part. He didn't uh, just stumble into a story that, or a song lyric that was hard for people to understand or was open to lots of different interpretations. Anyway, this actually goes back to that idea of the choice. Everything should be a choice. If your story is inaccessible or hard for the average person to understand, uh, make sure that that is a result of, of, of a deliberate choice and not something that has happened accidentally. Uh, if it is indeed a, a case of you having sort of inadvertently locked the reader out by way of your own sort of obsessiveness about laying out all these facts, you may need to revisit that or, you know, show it to friends, have them read it and, and get their reaction so as to make sure that, you know, you're telling it in, in the most accessible way possible. Make sure that people understand what it is that you're trying to do. Number five, less is more, or it can be anyway. <laughs> Again, sort of <laughs> undercutting my own advice here. I think less is more. Uh, most people have heard this statement, but in case you haven't, uh, it is the idea that, you know, sometimes putting less into something can make it more effective, more memorable. Um, uh, I would say a good example of this is the design of Baymax uh, in Big Hero 6. Um, that uh, he, uh, the, the design of that character is greatly... Uh, streamlined and uh, there aren't a whole bunch of different colors, uh, there aren't a whole bunch of different facial features, but that's what makes it uh, interesting and appealing as a design. Uh, so that's, I think, an excellent example of less is, less is more w within the artistic realm. I think, you know, uh, musically, I think you can find examples of that. Songs in which they decided, you know, let's not have the band play on this one. Let's just have it be the vocalist and an acoustic guitar. Uh, or the vocalist and the piano, and nothing else. Well, that's a kind of a less is more decision. They decided to cut things back in order to make a more powerful impact. And so I sort of wanted to get in here, or it can be anyway. I wanted to add this in because it's, uh, you know, less is more makes it sound like I'm saying it is always better to simplify and reduce things and be minimalist uh, sometimes more can be more, let's face it. Uh, and uh, so th that's why I wanted to say, you know, consider it as a strategy. Less is more. Sometimes, uh, or often, very effective. Let's move on now to number six. 
you don't need to obsess about finding your own style. Um, this is something that I hear, especially among young people, uh, very concerned about, you know, how do I find my style? How do I make sure that I have a style? It's very important for me to have that one, you know, copyright, uh, instantly recognizable style. And, um, you know, most of the artistic people that I've heard of or talked to about this topic have uh, sort of agreed that you don't have to go in search of your style. You just keep working. You will have a style, inevitably, you can't help but have a style. It, it, it sort of just flows uh, from the process of, of working a lot. And little by little, um, organically, you will find that you do things that are different uh, than what other people do. I, I do believe, like, sort of in a calculated way, trying to um, formulate a style just seems unnatural to me and, uh, as I said, not necessary. I think uh, stay focused on just doing good work and uh, inevitably you will you will find that you, what you're doing is different from what other people do. Uh, and even if you're not a super stylish person, not everybody has to have a bold, instantly recognizable style. I don't, I don't know if my style is, you know, super, super recognizable. Um, partly because I'm constantly changing my style as I go from one project to the next. Um, but this idea of, of, of everyone being, you know, some sort of, you know, on the level of Andy Warhol or some kind of, like, instantly recognizable thing, it, it almost can become a, a sort of a shtick, almost, this, this gimmicky uh, effort at, at, at having a... Uh, a flashy style, and I, I think really that it's better not to so self-consciously uh, attempt to create such a thing. Let's move on now to number seven. There are very, very few rules. Everyone finds his or her own way of doing things. Uh, kind of a funny thing to say, because it sounds like I'm listing off rules uh, in this video, you know, the ten, the do's and don'ts, these are the laws of creativity. No, indeed, that is not what I mean to say. You know me, people who've watched my videos. I, I'm the last person to say, everybody must do this, everybody must do that. Um, really, I think the reason that I decided to include this one is I, I think, uh, especially among young people or, you know, beginning creative people, uh, you do sort of imagine maybe that there are these right and wrong ways of doing things and you you are eager to have someone tell you, you know, what paper should I use? Um, what size should I be working at? What is the one right way? What is the, the, the industry standard that everybody uses? Well, there may be certain things like that um, in different industries, but uh, I believe more often than not, uh, you find, once you get into these industries, that there are not these hard and fast rules of things that, 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 that everyone is kind of finding their own way of doing things. Uh, and you talk to one musician and they say, well, I do it this way, but this other musician does it the other way. And, and, and we both have had success, you know. Um, so I don't mean to say that there are no um, industry standards. Surely there are in certain things. But uh, you may be surprised as you get into doing things professionally uh, if you are so lucky to be able to do that. You may, you may be surprised the degree to which there are not such rules and that everyone is kind of finding their own way, the way that comes naturally to them, or sort of devising their own methods of solving certain problems. Let's go on to number eight. Content dictates form. Now, this is the one where it's maybe the hardest to understand what it is I'm talking about. Uh, and I'm I have to cr give credit to uh, Stephen Sondheim, the great uh, lyricist, uh, who um, I, I believe came up with that one, or at least says it a lot in interviews. And to explain what it means, content dictates form. You start with the content, the, the sort of meaning of what it is that you're doing, and then you determine the format the best way of delivering it to the world. Uh, so uh, to sort of clarify, I would say, um, let's say you are the kind of person who wants to write a novel and you're like, all right, I'm going to sit down and write this novel. And you get halfway into the novel and you realize that what you're working with really lends itself more to being a short story. Um, it all takes place in one evening in a single room 
uh, with uh, you know one or two characters, and it resolves itself quite quickly. And and you're like, no, 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 this is a novel, and you're like trying to you're padding it out. Let's introduce a few more characters. Well, we'll mix in some more locations, and you're trying like crazy to stretch this thing into novel length, and it's just not happening because you know the the content does not justify the form that you're trying to stretch it into or cram it into. Um, and that's what content dictates form is all about. You you start what, with what it is that that you've got in terms of an idea, and then you uh, choose the format that best suits that idea. I mean, let's say for example you've got a uh, a concept that involves a bunch of characters who get together at a coffee shop, <laughs> and they tend to have little misadventures that resolve themselves quite quickly again and again. Well, you've got a you've got a TV show idea there, right? That's not a movie. That is more of a TV show. Uh, and so, yeah, just pay attention to the the kernel of your idea, and and then make sure that the format you choose to present it to the world is is uh, is the natural one. I tend to come up with ideas that are sort of movie length. They have a beginning, a middle. Uh, a, quite a long middle that builds towards a climactic sequence, and then they are resolved. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I may present it to the world as a graphic novel, uh, but I don't try to stretch it out into an endless series um, of comics that goes on and on forever, because uh, that's not what the idea is telling me to do. The idea is saying, look, this is, this is a series of graphic novels that comes to a conclusion relatively soon. All right, we're up to number nine in my ongoing list. You don't have to do the thing you love professionally. Um, I think sometimes uh, people get a little fixated on this idea of, uh, are you an amateur? Are you a professional? One of the greatest comic book writers of all time, Harvey Pekar, uh, was working at a hospital throughout his uh, entire adult life. And that was how he paid the bills. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically all the way through to retirement, he was a full-time um, employee of a, of a local hospital. Uh, and in a way, when I saw the movie that uh, was sort of summarizing his life, I, I envied him a little. <laughs> I thought, well, wouldn't it be awesome to, to have this job that takes care of all the health insurance and all that stuff, and then you just start doing this work on the side? Um, but uh, that wasn't really the point of it. What I was trying to say is that, you know, if you find that, uh, uh, at least at the beginning, you're not able to pay the bills off of your art, don't beat yourself up about that. Um, understand that that's just the way it goes for a lot of people, and indeed there's, there's no shame in uh, going your entire life without making a living at this creative thing, you know, especially these days. Very few people can. Um, I don't know if any of you watching this are from the music industry, but I think that the way the music industry has gone has made it very hard, very hard for people to make a full-time living. Because, well, I mean, look at it. People aren't buying music anymore. They're streaming it off Spotify. I don't want to get into a big, <laughs> you know, uh, diatribe about this, but, uh, you know, I think that industry has been very hard hit by the, the, the changing ways uh, of the of the economics of the industry and so certainly if you are a musician you could be incredibly talented and still fail to make a full-time living these days uh, and you kind of have to chalk it up to being born at the wrong time sadly uh, in, a, in an earlier age you would have made a full-time living uh, so anyway not to put it in such a negative way really what I meant to, was to reassure you that uh, there's no shame in that and that in fact uh, I myself uh, for a long time was um, you know public speaking was crucial to being able to feed my family uh, you know doing lots of other things besides the published work uh, to get by and um, that's just the way of the world and, and you shouldn't uh, be too hard on yourself uh, if that's the way it ends up for you and now we come to the last of my uh, uh, principles of creativity. Number 10, you don't need a brilliant idea. It's just as good to take a simple idea and execute it brilliantly. <laughs> of course, executing uh, something brilliantly, that is a tall order. But uh, I do think that sometimes people uh, think that you need some amazingly original idea even to get started, and I don't think that's the case. Um, I would give as an example Toy Story. Uh, the idea that toys uh, come alive while we're not looking is, um, 
I'm pretty sure an idea that had been done a number of times previous to Toy Story. Uh, not a wildly original idea, and, and I uh, suspect the, the people behind Toy Story would agree with that. Uh, but what makes it so great is the execution, the way of what you did with that idea. Right? They took this basic idea of toys coming to life, and then they created this sort of, you know, buddy film uh, about uh, these two characters. Uh, they just took the premise and really ran with it in a way that created a classic. Uh, and so I think that's, to me, that's a, a fine example of, um, you know, idea, not necessarily brilliant, but the execution of the idea, what they did with it. That's where the brilliance comes in, and uh, I do believe with master storytellers, uh, you can give them almost any idea, any premise, and they will do something amazing with it, just because they understand the basic principles uh, of storytelling. Well, I uh, am going to go grab my books to uh, say one final thank you to people before we wind this video down. Always super appreciative of anyone who supports me by ordering my books, Mickey Falls, Brody's Ghost, the graphic novel series, The Realism Challenge, my book about hyper-realism, and of course Mastering Manga and Mastering Manga 2. I really couldn't do it without you folks. Thank you so much for getting those books, but let's go ahead and grab this pen and put it down. <laughs> I want to thank you all for watching this video. I hope you found it helpful, and I'll be back with another one real soon.